Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here. BB King's here in New York City. Tonight you're going to witness a very rare treat. British soul jazz band Incognito have made a pit stop here on their short tour here in the States and the performing selections off their brand new record, Surreal. I sat down with Bluey and members of Incognito and we talk about the brand new record. Bluey on this project kind of did a musical cleansing. One, he brought in some brand new writers to write the music for Surreal as well as brought in a brand new set of young members to the 15 band Incognito. We're going to sit down and talk about the new CD. We're going to talk about reflections of playing and keeping this ensemble together for well over 31 years, as well as talk about how he's taken soul jazz and made it his own, especially coming from Britain. <laughs> Surreal. It's a very surreal record. I mean, it seems like you did some musical cleansing when you recorded this record. Oh, thank you. Uh, it was cleansing and uh, also it was, uh, I think, a, a journey that I thought I was never going to be able to kind of go on because uh, I'd been making, I'd been writing in a way uh, that was not really open to other people coming in and sharing that writing world with me. I always thought that I'm going to do the bulk of the the lyric writing in Incognito. On this album, I've got, I'm kind of sharing it with uh, Mo Brandis, and I'm sharing it with uh, Van, uh, with Natalie Williams, and uh, it, it it was an, it was a really fresh experience for me. And you also out with the old and in with the new band. I mean, this is a new amalgamation for you. Yeah, I mean, but for me, it's it's been like that for 33 years. You know, 33 years, 1,500 plus musicians and singers. It's like uh, it's it was meant to be a musical institution that would be evolving all the time. You know, Mesa is still part of this this project. She's on three tracks, but Mo is getting getting a lot of shine on this. He's a yeah. dynamic he's a dynamic musician and singer. That's right. Um, in a way, is is the new generation of people influenced by the same music. I've been influenced by the music of Stevie Wonder and Donny Hathaway. But then you had singers like uh, uh, Tony and um, uh, to a certain extent most of the male singers that came into the band to, to sing were kind of like maybe like first generation influence of that music. And now you've got someone like Mo Brandis who's a bit younger who, who is who's singing music for uh, songs for, uh, and, and then a vocal style from that, from that root, from those roots. But also, you know, he's kind of grown up with other singers like John Legend and, uh, and, 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 and even like crooners, you know, like the, the world of, of crooners that is very popular these days. So he's, he's coming from a slightly different angle, which gives us, you know, a, a, a fresh sound. And this guy is from Germany? From Germany, yeah, via Swaziland. He's been living in Africa for, for a while. And that's, that's, his, um, 
that's his major role in, in life is to try and make the world better for, this, for the people of Swaziland. Bluey, I've followed you probably for about 25 years, and this open door policy you have with musicians, how do you go about selecting vocalists for the band, and how long does it take for certain musicians to adapt to the music that you write? Adapting has got to be instant because we have no time. We don't, we're always gigging, we're always touring, uh, we never stop. Uh, so therefore, you join this band, two weeks later you'll be on the road with this band, you, or the very next day. You know, um, sometimes we don't ha you don't have, have time to rehearse with the band. You know, you're given a set, set of tapes and you're told to kind of, if you can learn, learn those songs and put your personality in that and come over as these songs belong to you when you play, with either as a drummer, a sax player, or a singer. Um, that you have a limited time because we're working all the time so, and the singers you find sometimes you're introduced by other singers to other singers and sometimes you go into a bar you walk in and you hear someone and they sound fantastic or a recommendation of a friend but all the time you've they've got to um, you've got to feel an affinity with them straight away you know from the moment they sing either down the phone like Mesa for the first time you know uh, as, a, as a phone audition or you know when they walk in the room and sing to you, can you sing something for me, just a cappella, you know. talk about the beginnings of this. This this band started 1978-79 and this this journey has been very interesting because people still love you. There's a line of people checking out this sold out show. Tell me about how Incognito started. Um, well, you know, as a teenager I was in, in various bands and when you're in a band you're in a gang. You know, it's like, oh we're wearing this outfit and uh, oh, this is what we're going to do after the show, and you've got to run with the gang. Then you get to a certain age. Uh, in my early 20s, I, I decided that um, I would do something that really gets away from that band mentality. Because, you know, I was, I was reading different stuff to the rest of my bands. I was listening to different stuff to the rest of my band. You know, if I was in a band and we were a funk band, we were, they were only listening to bands like Cameo, Earth, Wind and & Fire, you know, and, 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 and you know, th this, kind of, this kind of music. And they, were, uh, and they weren't really branching out, whereby I was listening to Joni Mitchell, Santana, and I was, I was buying um, folk songs and then and, and, and jazz music, and I was listening to as much Coltrane as I was listening to Stevie Wonder. So um, I suppose that made me want to reach out to a wider family, you know. Um, and I like the, the attitude of like not really pandering to that whole idea that you should look a certain way or you should be uh, of a certain denomination or, or uh, have a, a certain uh, belief to be a, a part of a group. You know, I think you have to be, to, to the kind of band I want to be in embraces everybody, you know. Uh, all colors, all creeds, sizes, you know, and uh, it's, it's, and and that was my idea from the beginning. So you'll find that this open door policy is not just to musicians and singers; it's also to people who have uh, a very open, um, an open mind. You know, there was a time when you guys came out in in Britain. The BBC didn't play a lot of. African-American soul funk music and there was a thing called pirate radio where you 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 got hooked up that's right that's right um, and the, the guy who would later sounding sign incognito and give us uh, and, and 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 
promote this, the records that were at our biggest success, uh, albums like um, Positivity and 100 Degrees and Rising, was a guy called Giles Peterson. And I first met Giles Peterson. Uh, he was the first guy to interview me as Incognito. And I remember being in his garden shed, in his gar and his mum made tea, and and um, and she brought tea and biscuits for us. And uh, I I brought him an album which he'd never heard before by Ayato, and uh, and he turned me onto a bunch of tunes, and and this was like the very beginning. And he was just on a pirate radio, and we needed that, and uh, that that early um, kind of in a way it makes you want to go for it because you have to you're part of the setup that that is constructed for others to follow you know if you're part of the building blocks you're always going to have a, a respect from musicians and from uh, people in the music business for having achieved that so in a way it kind of works for me to be part of those building blocks and at the same time there were other really really monumental bands coming out of of the uk also yeah. loose ends Sade. i mean yeah. that was a great time in the early 80s that's right um when uh, there was a, a group of british bands that were making a mark across uh, in, over in america and kind of in a way influencing the uh, american music direction which up until then hadn't been the case you know um uh, i suppose not definitely not with soul music you know, we'd just been tapping into America, tap into America, tap into America. Then it went like the other way for a while. And uh, suddenly we had like that beat that Soul to Soul had put together. It was on every record, <laughs> you know, every record. <laughs> This is your inauguration to Incognito and performing, and this has got to be a heck of a transition for you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's incredible for me to be a part of this band. I've, I, uh, I've always been a big fan of Incognito. You know, I, I grew up on that music. Um, I actually, I was in a cover band when I was maybe 16, and we were doing some Incognito songs, talking loud, and still a friend of mine. And to then all of a sudden stand on stage with people like Bluey and Mesa uh, and all these amazing musicians and actually perform those songs, the original songs with, with that band is an amazing feeling, you know, and I'm really grateful to, to be part of this band. You know, another thing that's very important about Incognito is the Incognito sound, the horns, you're, you're strumming on that guitar, and just the vocals, I mean, the male and the female interaction, that's something that is a very important part of the 33-year journey. Of course. Um, there are certain things that, from beginning, identify 
uh, people identify you with. You know, very often I'm told, uh, man, we want to sound like incognito or that incognito sound, you know, so that, and I know what it is, um, but I, I also, in a way, fight it a little bit, you know, when I'm going to make a new record. I have to because that's what I do naturally. I'm excited by horn lines that, re that uplift the chorus or that interaction between vocalists, male and female, or that uh, the, the, the chords that are kind of, uh, that, 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 that have a sensuality as well as an excitement, uh, a, a funk, but a kind of like sensuality with, that brings out the voice in a sensual way. You know, it's, I, I'm always attracted to those things, and, and those Fender Rhodes and my, my picking guitar style and my choppy style is always going to be part of what we do in the percussive element. But, you know, in a way, even though I try, and I change it, and I think, oh, I've done something new. They say to me, that sounds so incognito. <laughs> so, so in a way, you can't help but be yourself, you know. <laughs> first time you met Mesa because Mesa really was again a big part of the 90s when Incognito kind of went in a whole nother direction. Yeah, I uh, suppose I, I'd been developing myself uh, uh, as, a, as a songwriter. I'd been working for people like Maxi Priest and uh, producing and working as a producer on in, in, in France and, and in Japan and uh, Suddenly, I had an opportunity through Talking Loud and Giles Peterson to be on the, on the Verve label and uh, that whole, what is now known as the Universal um, um, mu Music Machine. And uh, I was given an open kind of card policy where you can choose whoever you want from wherever they are, you know. So when that happened, I, I've always wanted to work with uh, American singers. Uh, that if you have two or three good singers in the UK, they're usually signed up and you have to go through their managers to kind of like even get them to sing on your records and, it's, and it becomes impossible. So I thought, let me go to America and find somebody because I remember saying to my friends, most people in America, you know, you stop somebody on the street and they've got a great voice. So <laughs> let me go to America and see if I can find a couple of really good singers who are out of work. And uh, my friend suggested a a, a few people and I had a list and uh, I went through the list and I asked him which of those singers would work for me because I wanted the one to, with the least deverish attitude and he suggested I call Mesa and that was my first call. I never made the other calls. The, uh, the other 20, 30 people that were on that list never even got to, hit, to hear from me because uh, it was like serendipity. It was really a ha very happy accident that she was she had finished working with Stevie Wonder she was struggling uh, to find the next job she she was she she didn't even have money to pay for the electricity and where, where she was but you know someone like Mesa with a voice like that you know when I first heard it over the phone I knew that I had to get her over but 
someone like that would have definitely made it anyway. You know, the fact that I, I played a small part in that meant that I could uh, tap into that from time to time. You know, it's like because I knew her career was going to take off anyway. So you know, you you're fortunate enough. And as a songwriter, once you once you find somebody's voice like this and you start to write songs, and I started writing songs like Still a Friend of Mine, Deep Waters, and and I start to the songs that I had. You know, I I sometimes I had I had a bunch of songs like Change and you know lyrics that I had had for like maybe ten, twelve years. Suddenly having a singer who I felt these I could put out these songs made a hell of a difference for me and um uh, and then on from then on I, it was like a glut of singers and just before Mesa I'd got to work with Justin Brown and we'd had a major hit in the clubs because the success of Incognito is not just from a from a commercial song point of view it's it's the clubs the clubs played a big part DJs have played a major part in our lives and um having a diva like Jocelyn Brown throw down and always there that opened up a major major door worldwide because there is that side of incognito the people who buy the albums then the people who kind of dance to incognito they buy the albums and the 12 inches <laughs> you talk about some really really important songs in your repertoire with Mesa still a friend of mine is one of them 25 years later did you ever in a million years think that this would be one of the staple songs of incognito as well as Mesa yeah um, no you you know you 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 hope with every song you have a hope you know you um in your mind you're writing for Shaka Khan in your mind you're writing for Stevie Wonder but when you have your uh, a singer which is part of a group then the the hope becomes like a little bit uh, more of a reality you know the dream cha changes a little bit because suddenly you, you do it and then you realize well it's making me feel this way i got a feeling a lot of people are going to believe this i got a feeling this story is going to be bigger than than normal here and when that happens and but you don't you don't really imagine just how big it can be until it happens to you you know uh, someone like me would have been happy if we'd sold like you know like a few thousand copies in the territory of those songs that would have been m major enough for me but to be able to sustain a career with an 11 sometimes 15 sometimes 30 piece band you know depending on 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 the budget of 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 the tour um it's uh, it's been an amazing story, you know. It's been an amazing trip because of songs like that. Because when people find songs like that, they don't just come one year and don't come the next year. When you when when they make an uh, they identify with something as being, you know, where what makes it really work for a songwriter or for a band is that when people feel it's their song. You know, it's no longer the song I wrote for me, so it's not about me, it's not about my relationship anymore. It may have been stemmed from that. Now it's somebody's discovery of their girlfriend, it's their first kiss out, it's what they danced to on their first night out, it's it's the song they had made babies to, it's the song that, oh, my, my kid is, is, the first song they ever sang was, was your song, blah, 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 you know, and it's like, oh, my, their kid's graduation, and then the kid neck now, it's like, oh, my mum and dad used to play this all the time, you know, and, and this is my favourite song, blah, 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 Incognito has been part of my life, and now I'm the next generation, their kids, you know, because it stays, because the song now is part of their history it's making when songs become part of people's history that's when you know you've got a career <laughs> Mesa, you were a very integral part of, and still are an integral part of, Incognito when you joined the band in the 90s. 
Where were you musically, and how did Bluey approach you to join the band? Well, musically, I was uh, singing background for Stevie Wonder at the time, and I was doing a session work for other musicians and producers out in California while I was waiting for Stevie to go do his thing. And um, one of the producers uh, is a Scottish drummer named Steve Harvey that was best friends with Bluey. And when Bluey was looking for singer Steve sent him a list of 20 names and um, according to Bluey, uh, Bluey asked him in addition to several things, criteria that he had for the singers, he wanted to know which one would he leave his kids to and Steve said he would leave them to me and that's why Bluey called me first and uh, during the conversation that night Bluey uh, was just supposed to talk to me about my audition, what it would be like and when I was coming to England for the audition but he asked me to sing f for him, and I sang for him a couple times. And then after that, the next morning, we start the conversation, and the second night he said he would call me, uh, have his management call me when it was my time for the audition. But what happened was um, his manager called me the next morning and said that he didn't know what I sang to Bluey last night, but I got the gig, and they want me to come over immediately. And so uh, about a week and a half later, I moved to England. It seems like you know your role in Incognito, and there's songs that are just for your voice. Mm -hmm. That's very hard for a person, I mean, and you've been solo for a while too, <laughs> for you to come back home to, to the beginning. Mm -hmm. How does that feel? I mean, it feels great. I, I mean, I, I don't have to, uh, I didn't have to choose either or. I get to do both, uh, so I'm very blessed that I have a dual career going on, you know, I have a solo career and I have a career with Incognito and uh, I've just been a very blessed person and I'm grateful for it because like I said, it's kept me going for 20, 20 years. <laughs> What does soul music mean to you? Soul music is um, music that uh, is for the mind, the heart, and the body. Um, there, are, there, is mus there is music out there that makes me feel that, that m listen to it uh, on more of an intellectual basis. Or I'm looking for maybe just the story within the song. And some feet, some some tunes just make me tap my feet. Some people, some tunes make me dance. But I'm not thinking in terms of uh, any message or, in, or or anything. Soul music seems to be like what Stevie Wonder gave me, what even James Brown gave me, even on on, on his funk. You know that it, what Marvin Gaye gave me. You know what Earth, Wind, and Fire, Morris White's writing, 
and the arrangement, the sophistication of, these, of his writing and the rawness of, of James Brown's beats, you know, that is soul because for me it speaks to all aspects of me as a human being. It speaks to my heart, you know, it speaks to, to, to the rhythm, speaks to my body, you know, so it, it taps in all at once, you know, on all levels. So that's soul music for me, a music that, that completes me. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at BB King's here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank Bluey as well as the members of Incognito for their time, as well as the staff and management here at BB King's. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace. <laughs> Thank you.